Hello and welcome to this episode of Smarter, a podcast by clinicians for clinicians, brought to you by Marta, an Australian leader in healthcare for more than a century. My name is Gillian Whiting. And I'm Ash Mundelo, breast cancer clinical nurse consultant at the Marta Private Hospital, Brisbane. And we're coming to you from Mianjin, the land on which this podcast is being recorded. Today, we're joined by Dr. Emma Clarkson, breast and endocrine surgeon at Marta Hospital, Brisbane and Private Hospital, Brisbane. Emma has a special interest in oncoplastic breast surgery, all areas of benign and malignant breast disease, and management of patients at high risk for developing breast cancer. She's also a foundation member of the panel that set up the first statewide oncoplastics breast reconstruction initiative in Queensland, which gives regional and remote patients access to tertiary level breast surgery and reconstruction. Today, she's going to talk to us about which breast surgery is best for your patient. We are Marta. We are Marta. We are Marta. This is Smarter. Emma, welcome to Smarter. Thanks for having me. Now, there's so many treatment options for breast cancer now. Can we, can we focus on surgical ones to begin with? Can you give us a brief overview? So that is a really big question because uh, there are a lot of options these days, but you could probably break it down into three categories. There is a thing called a lumpectomy, which is basically removing the tumour and a cuff of normal tissue around the outside. Um, that's a small operation, quick recovery. Then everybody knows about mastectomy, which is removal of most of the breast tissue, the so 98% plus. Probably uh, the best known version of that is a simple mastectomy with a side-to-side -side incision and a flat chest wall, but you can also have mastectomy and reconstruction either at the same time as the mastectomy or later on. And then there's also a middle ground, and I think that's the part of breast surgery that most people are still discovering. Um, and that is when it's probably not suitable to have a lumpectomy, usually because the tumour is too big or it involves multiple areas in the breast, but probably not quite enough to require a mastectomy. So it's that grey zone. Um, and that falls within the remit, I guess, of oncoplastic breast surgery, where we reconstruct the breast using the tissue that's already there. So we know some cases are straightforward and some are more complex. What are the key elements that you like to consider when presenting patients with options? Yeah, so I think that's a very important question and there are some elements to that which are fundamental. So I think the first one is the nature of the disease and that's basic things like the size of the tumour and the biological behaviour of the tumour, um, whether it's spread to local lymph nodes, whether it involves both breasts. So that's what we call disease-related factors. Then there's patient physicality factors. So what size is the woman's breast? How much of it could be removed and still have a breast form remaining? And then finally, there's the woman's preference or man's preference, although it's a lot more so with women. Um, and it would never cease to surprise me how often you can have similar patients on paper. So same type of disease, same type of body structure and habitus, but they will make different decisions based on their own internal value structure. So that's where the education part comes along. I think basically if you choose to treat the cancer well, you remove the cancer and or the lymph nodes that are affected. And then what you do after that point is really based on those other factors and it's heavily lent on by the patient's preferences. And patients can't give you a preference unless they understand the pros and cons of those approaches. So that decision tree in education is incredibly important. Patient values are incredibly important. Is that something that you specifically ask them about during a consult? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's an explicit thing that I ask them. Do you Have you done some background reading? Are there things that you're interested in? Are there things that just don't gel with you? If so, Why? because I want to make sure that those decisions are based on facts and evidence and education and not just something that has been heard or it could perhaps have been misconstrued. Um, but I also get a gist of things just by having a conversation. So we'll start talking about things in general and patients will give away clues as to what really interests them and what doesn't. And so it's a combination of those two things a general rapport with the patient and getting to know them in the consultation. And sometimes that takes more than one appointment. 
know, sometimes the first appointment, there's a lot of information and patients need to go away and allow it to sediment and think over their options and discuss it and talk to their family members and then create a new list of questions and come back. And so the decision tree starts like this and then it starts stepping in until there's a very limited choice or a little a limited decision as to what's going to happen and then the patient will have their comfortable decision sitting in their lap. And that process is really important. It's probably more important than the actual technical surgery because that's a known quantity, it is what it is, but the decision on how to get to that operation is quite complex. On the surgery element, if we, we look at statistics, mm-hmm. um, what is the breakdown in terms of the most common of the surgical treatments and why is it yes. the most common? So definitely the most common surgical treatment is a lumpectomy. That's also called a wide local excision or a complete local excision, so WLE or CLE. Um, and the reason that it's the most common and probably also the most selected is because um, if you have a small cancer, it's a really effective treatment. It's a quick recovery. It's maybe an overnight stay in hospital and you get to preserve the majority of your native breast, which is a really strong advantage for most women. Um, And the other thing is that cancer through screening, screening programs are being detected when they're small and early. So I think the combination of it being small early cancers that are found in the majority of women and it being a really uh, effective oncology treatment, which maintains the baseline of the patient's breast as close to that as we can, that's a great combination. So it makes sense to me that that's the most common um, selection. In 2015 to 2016, health system expenditure on cancer and other neoplasms in Australia was estimated to be $10.1 billion. The cancer type with the highest expenditure within that was breast cancer, with $1,056 million being spent. $375 million was attributed to hospital inpatient services and $269 million was on the national screening program. Emma, what if a patient is hesitant? How do you respectfully reinforce your recommendation? I always respect the patient's decision and timeline. So sometimes patients will get a recommendation from me and they will not accept it for various reasons. It doesn't change my recommendation, but it also doesn't change the fact that I respect them as an independent individual who has the right to make choices. Um, And my approach really is to try and support them and to try and figure out why they are not so keen on that recommendation. Oftentimes, if you can unpack that, Mm -hmm. there is some part of it that you can address. Um, And also, there is a subtlety in giving patients time and space. It doesn't all have to be done in that moment. Sometimes just allowing them to breathe and then circle back and come and see me or come and see Ash because sometimes a different person reinforcing that information can be very helpful. A lot of the times patients will come around to a recommendation anyways. Um, There is another thing about this, which is patients with breast cancer don't choose to have breast cancer, right? It is something that is given to them. So they lose control of the situation. And so at times patients just want to push back on what's happening to them temporarily completely normal, natural, understandable part of the process. So I think I try and hold them close. I try and see them regularly and I wait and support them and engage the team. And honestly, Ash, would you say it's quite unusual to have somebody who completely disregards the recommendations? Yeah, that's right. I think a lot of women come to us and even during a a long consult, they'll often hear, I have cancer. And sometimes that's all they'll all they'll hear. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we want them to go home, read more, come back to us with more questions. Yeah. What about that element of time, though? Striking that that balance and respecting the process, but also treating that cancer quickly and early. Sure. So um, there is an in, an indefinite timeline, but most cancers are not the sort of galloping conditions where there is a change over the next day or week or two weeks. That's not generally how these cancers behave. 
So you do have a little bit of time to make those decisions and to have those recurrent appointments. And I always try and um, reassure people that you can take a week, you can probably take a fortnight to think about what you want to do and to circle back with more questions. That's safe. It's okay. And actually it's a good thing because at the end of the day, you end up with a better decision. You feel more grounded in that decision. And if you feel better engaged with your choice, you're probably going to have a better operative pathway anyways and a better recovery. So there is no downside to that. Around 1.7 million women participated in Breast Screen Australia's screening program in 2020-2021, accounting for nearly half of the targeted age group of 50 to 74-year-olds. Breast cancer mortality has decreased since Breast Screen Australia began, from 74 deaths per 100,000 women aged 50 to 74 in 1991 to 38 deaths per 100,000 women in 2021. So there's a 52-year-old woman who's presented to breast screen for her regular mammogram where it was detected that she had a multicentric breast cancer. Her GP gave her an overview of what to expect before referring um, to you, flagged her that she'd be possible for a mastectomy as a potential surgical treatment. You see the patient and instead of recommending a mastectomy, you've offered her a reduction mammoplasty surgery. How did you get to this point and why? Okay, so I think this is a great example of that option that sits in between lumpectomy and mastectomy. Now, again, meeting with this patient, I would talk to, be, talk to them about all the options, including mastectomy and reconstruction, because after a summation of pros and cons, that might be her choice. However, in this day and age, there are a lot of women who have a lot of breast tissue and are wearing larger breast cup sizes and who may have at some point considered having a breast reduction for any number of reasons, you know, neck and back pain, difficulty exercising, rashes and problems with skin, difficulty with clothing, feeling not comfortable in their own body. Um, and a breast reduction, after all, is just removing volume from the breast and reshaping the breast. Traditionally, that's been because of women having uncomfortably large breasts for one of those reasons. But why can't we repurpose that operation as a breast cancer operation? And that's something that we do these days. So rather than having a full mastectomy, the larger area of tumour is removed and the remaining breast tissue is reshaped exactly the same way as it would be if you had a breast reduction. And this way, more breast tissue can be removed in a safe way, but instead of having a large contour deformity in the breast, you have a reshaped, rounded, lifted, smaller breast. And for some women, that's getting a bit of a silver lining from a difficult situation too, which, you know, that's a nice thing if you can achieve that. So adaptive mammoplasty, which is essentially what Ash was talking about, having a breast reduction repurposed for the point of doing a larger lumpectomy operation and then reshaping the rest of the breast tissue is becoming a, a pretty popular option. We meet so many women at MARTA that present to us with um, breast cancer. A lot of them will think that their best option for survival is mastectomy. Now, we know that's not necessarily the case, does mastectomy improve their chances of survival? No, that is a very confident no. <laughs> so, and I think this is something that is um, part of my job and I will usually bring it up in a consultation because I think it, it, it seems like a very natural thing to assume that that's the case, that mastectomy must be better. But there are big studies which have run over many, many years and followed patients over a long time that show that actually a mastectomy stands toe to toe with a well-done lumpectomy where you remove all of the breast tumour followed by radiation. And I think that's an important thing to consider. Lumpectomy will then come as a package deal with radiotherapy. But mastectomy is not a better treatment. So um, some people are really surprised when they hear mm. that. You know, it doesn't affect loco-regional recurrence. It doesn't affect um, survival down the track. 
Where, where does that come from, that belief? I don't think there's any one reason. I think there's probably an amalgamation of things. So some people have just thought it off their own de novo. Other people may have spoken to others or gone online and investigated it there and maybe they're looking at blog sites or other unvetted sources of information. But nonetheless, it's common. And I think it, you can sometimes see the relief on people's faces when you say, you know, unless you really want a mastectomy, then there is a different option. Um, and sometimes uh, allowing people a bit of space, they really do change change their approach. Sometimes not, but, and that's mm. okay, but sometimes they do. Breast cancer mm. care is clearly becoming more complex and that's something that you've mentioned. What about the future? How do you see it evolving? Um, is it simplifying or is it education? Where are we headed, Emma? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball <laughs> to be able to that answer that be question. Great, those simple, those but, crystal balls. Um, is it simplifying? No. So it's becoming more and more complex. And I think that's something that as clinicians, we really have to try and um, present in as simple a way as possible. But uh, as treatments become more effective and more sophisticated and choices broaden, the complexity of the decision making does the same thing. Um, but I also think that maybe patients are amazingly able to take on that complexity. Um, some people uh, need a little bit of extra support, but they usually can. They usually can understand enough to make an informed decision. So getting back to your question, is it going to get simpler? Definitely not, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Before the patient gets to you, what can GPs and other clinicians do to help ease or simplify the decision-making? So I don't think there's anything you can do to ease or simplify the decision-making, but I think one thing that you can make patients aware of is that with the new options for treatment, the decision isn't simple. So that when patients, um, or isn't always simple, so that when patients then go for their consultation, they're expecting you to have a little bit more of a complex conversation and they're expecting that it might take a little bit more than one consultation to come to that outcome. Mm -hmm. Other things that you can do, although it's not necessary, like it's okay for patients to come to a consultation knowing very little because that's part of what we will do. We will go through that information with them and we'll focus on the things that are applicable to their scenario. Um, but you can provide some um, well-vetted information sites. Mm -hmm. In some instances, having contact with one of our breast care nurses ahead of the consultation can help because oftentimes Ash or Maria will understand where the general consultation pattern is going to head and they can start giving patients some reading information and start preparing them. Um, so outside of that, the other thing that is helpful is not to, not to limit a patient's options too early by telling them that they're probably going to need X, Y or Z because it might be that you're 100% correct and that's great, but it, it's better for a patient to come in with an open mind and not, not being... Um, sort of preset with a certain surgical decision. This has been fantastic conversation and, and as you said, I think probably we all know someone who's, who's been touched with breast cancer. Thank you so much, Emma, but before you go. So before we go, we just want to introduce you to a little segment um, that we like to call the checkup. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, you've heard Here about this, Emma. You're excited. I'm um, trying to be. <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is about um, finding out more about Emma as a medical professional and also Emma the person as well, getting to know you. So Ash is okay. going to ask you uh, five quick questions. Be kind, Ash. <laughs> I will be kind, Emma. Okay. I'm always kind to you. Okay. If you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? I'd be an artist. Yeah. I love to paint and draw. So that's what I would do. How do you want your patients to see you? As a safe space and as a good ear. Okay, if a genie could grant you one wish, what would it be? If I was out of a job because there was no more breast cancer, I think I'd be pretty happy about it and then maybe I'd go off and become that artist. How would you describe your handwriting? Oh, terrible. It's not. It's micrographic. It's neat, but it's small. And illegible. It's lovely. You're too kind. <laughs> what is your superstition? I'm not superstitious in the slightest about anything. Are. Okay, that's good. I'd love to 
have some of that hoodoo in me, but I don't. (laughs) Too medical. Too medical. Thanks again so much for joining us on Smarter, Emma. For our listeners at home or in the car or having a well-deserved break between patients, thanks for tuning in. Join us for our next episode where we continue exploring women's health. See you next time on Smarter.